Thanks, Bob. It's uh, hard to follow that kind of introduction and Amal's uh, excellent lecture. But I'll say one thing, it's, it's easy to lead when, you have, when you're following great students. And I've had a lot of really great students. Bob was the TA for the class that built New Pearl. We, we talked about constructive math and we sketched out this idea without giving it a name or anything. And the entire class, uh, it was like 17 students, wanted to work on the project. This didn't go over well with my colleagues, but we got New Pearl built, um, and it's it then occupied my life ever since. So anyway, this talk is not about New Pearl, though. <clears throat> uh, the title, I, I have written um, a lot of pages in La Tech, and we'll probably put them on, uh, post them here. And the title is Two Lectures on Constructive uh, Type Theory. And that's a very simple title, and this is lecture one. So <laughs> that, that's the title of it. But um, my charge here from Zena and Bob was to not only talk about technical matters, but to talk a bit about uh, the philosophy and the history, uh, where it started and where I think it's going. And I would, I, I'd like it if in the second lecture tomorrow, if you all are still here on, on Saturday, that we spend maybe the last uh, 20 minutes uh, in a discussion. You know, Mark and I will be up here and, and we'll take questions. I've lectured for many years at the Mark Doberdorf Summer School, and that always happens at the end of every day. The lecturers face the uh, music, right? They get questions from everyone. And these are some of the most lively moments, as I recall, over the years at Mark Doberdorf. So I hope we can do that. And uh, I posed myself uh, three questions for us. Uh, I'll state them right now. So I want to know, what are the most uh, important and fundamental ideas in computer science and mathematics that can be best expressed in constructive type theory? You know, where, where does this type theory have a lot of purchase, a, a lot of influence on both computer science and mathematics? So that's one side. And then the other side is uh, where are we weak? You know, where, where uh, do we have trouble competing with set theory? Because if you talk to mathematicians, set theory is their default language. And there are some wonderful quotes they, they love to say, look, every theorem in mathematics can be explained in ZFC set theory. It is just a result in that set theory. And that's uh, adopted essentially worldwide by almost all mathematicians except the constructivists, and that's a pretty small group, mostly in uh, Holland, right? And a few of them, a few of them scattered around the world. Um, so uh, why, why aren't, uh, could, could that ever happen, that people will say a few years from now, decades or so from now, you know, we can express everything in computer science very precisely in constructive type theory, and the mathematicians agree, and they say, yeah, we, uh, we do that too. Could that happen? So I want to talk about that. And um, I'm also very interested in how proof assistants can have a large impact on research and education. And I, I have this belief from talking to a lot of undergrads that, who get very excited about proof assistants, principally Koch, that's the one we use uh, most at, for teaching at Cornell. And the students just get incredibly excited about this. They also get somewhat misled. I mean, I'm going to prove a theorem to you uh, tomorrow called the Bloom Size Theorem. And I kept asking the students to tell me, like, what's the fundamental idea here? And I narrowed my question down on some of these things to, OK, why is this idea true? What's the fundamental reason? The very eager students waving his hand. I said, OK, yeah, what is it? Because Koch said it was obvious. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. <laughs> that, that's your explanation for why this is true? I said, I, I never want to hear that again in class. Not because it's Koch, but I want your idea. You know, <laughs> what were you thinking? Why is it true for you? So um, those, that's part of the second question. The third one 
is uh, what ideas will you miss out on if you only know one of Agda, Koch, New Pearl, HOL? What are you going to miss if you know one of them and not the others? So that's, um, those are questions I'd like to get to. But the outline, OK, I actually have a very precise outline of what I'm going to talk about. So uh, let's put it here. So the first topic I, I want to talk about are what I call the core uh, logical types. And um, this is the part that we all s agree on, right? So New Pearl, Agda, Koch, we all understand these core types and how through propositions as types they give us logic. So I want to talk about that, why they're so important and so forth. And I'll talk a bit, as Zaina requested, about the history of this. Um, I'll be briefer than I had intended to be, so we don't spend too much time on that. But the history is fascinating to me. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about it. And then I want to go uh, beyond the core types. So you've got these core logical types, but indeed, uh, and, and this is, um, the core ones are the center of this idea of propositions as types, right? Also called, it goes by many names, uh, Curry-Howard isomorphism. That's my least favorite name because it's not really an isomorphism, but um, that's okay. And it has, it has several other names, and probably there are 20 some people. The book called The Curry Howard Isomorphism traces the history and credits about 20 people with coming up with this idea. But it's all about these types, the core logical types. That's what this is about. But I want to go beyond these and show you something that I think is really uh, the dynamic of this whole field. And that is that it's, uh, this thing is a two-way street. So you can either start on the logic side and think up the types, or you can start with the types and you'll find some of them are logical types. So we want to go both ways, at least examine the two directions on that street. And uh, one of those directions I'll talk about today leads to a new concept uh, in logic. So I'm going to call it uh, by its logical name. Um, and I, I think part of what I'm going to do in my time is stress a lot the connections to mathematics, because Amal did such an amazing job, and Bob as well, talking about the applications in computer science. But I'm, I'm interested in um, the applications to logic and mathematics as well. And one of the things that happens when you see that this is a two-way street, you bring into logic uh, some new operators. And in particular, uh, the operator that Mark has talked about is this uh, new quantifier, uh, which is a uniform uh, for all. And we'll, we'll talk about it in more detail. But this leads to a fundamental du new idea in logic called uniform validity. And I'll talk about that because um, Mark and I uh, published in uh, last year, 2014, um, a solution to a long-standing open problem. It was open for about 64 years to give a constructive completeness proof for intuitionistic first-order logic. People didn't know how to do that. They tried uh, based on its standard semantics. There was only a completeness proof uh, with respect to Kripke models. And we managed, because we had this new type, we noticed something and were able to push through over a couple of years a solution to this problem. And our referees, we had uh, a lot of referees on this paper, and many of them said, this is no fair to call it a solution to a 64-year-old 
old open problem because you guys introduced a new idea, a uniform validity. But it's an if and only if idea, right? Things are provable if and only if they're uniformly true, and we found the other direction. But the other referees said, wow, that's a cool new idea and logic, and we should publish the paper. So it's out there, and Mark is actually implementing this thing in New Pearl, which uh, will give uh, some pretty neat ways to take a realizer, just you write down a program, and you say, this is the program that realizes the uh, proposition, and Mark's algorithm will give you a proof in first order logic. So that's pretty cool, but we wouldn't have gotten to that <clears throat> without the two-way street idea here, that you can take types and think of them as new logical operators. Okay, and then um, I'm going to talk about an idea that I like a lot. Mark keeps finding things that I shouldn't like about this idea, but I'm going to try to convince you it's good. Um, these, are, I'm just going to call it right now insights. <laughs> so that's, uh, that, actually there is a result, but uh, insights uh, into, say, classical logic. Okay, so that's um, a safe way of telling you that I think we have a new and really good semantics in constructive type theory for classical logic. And in fact, classical type theory. We can turn this type theory into a classical one. I think it's pretty cool, but <laughs> you'll hear what Mark thinks about it. But anyway, you'll get to make up your own minds on, on that. I'll probably get to that today. And then uh, we'll just look ahead like Amal was doing here and see what's coming down the road, you know, uh, the way she was doing on open problems, really interesting, um, uh, interesting open problems to attack. All right, so that's the idea of, the, of this lecture one. Lecture two is um, going to start with a proof of one of my favorite theorems about the difference between Koch and uh, New Pearl. See, the, the Koch programming language is what I call a, a sub-recursive language, right? All of its all of its programs are total. And uh, New Pearl is a universal programming language. It, it allows partial recursive functions using Kleene's name for this. And there's um, a striking result about this from many years ago when that was my passion. When I, uh, when I was an assistant professor, I loved sub-recursive languages. I thought this was a really cool topic, and I had enough results there to get promoted, so I liked the area. But uh, they're very different, right? These sub-recursive languages have a lot of nice properties that Koch enjoys. And this was the kind of language that Gödel loved. He wanted the, the Herbrand gödel computable functions are the total computable functions, right? All the total uh, computable functions, Turing total functions. And that's what um, people focus on. But you know, there, and here's an exercise. First 10 minutes, we have an exercise. Why isn't there a programming language for those? You should all know the answer to this. There is no programming language. There cannot be a programming language for Gödel's favorite class of programs, the Herbrand Gödel uh, computable functions. So why is that? There's a simple exercise, not too hard. So um, what Koch has is a subset of those, right? And a reasonably small subset. And it's more like the primitive recursive functions. But there is an amazing theorem that you'll hear about tomorrow. This, um, that it's called the Bloom size theorem. And it says these subrecursive programs sometimes are arbitrarily longer uh, than the corresponding um, general recursive program, or a partial recursive function. 
And that's sort of surprising, but the, the reason I want to bring that up in the second lecture is that students who use Calk complain to me often, saying, wow, the program I got was just humongous. Why is it so big? Why is all this stuff there? So if you've had that uh, response, this theorem will show you why and why it's going to happen. OK, so let's get on then to the first thing, the core logical types. Question? Yeah. In Cock, it's straightforward to write an interpreter for a term complete language where one of the inputs to the interpreter is proof of termination. Yeah. How does that not get around this problem? Well, that gives you, for, for all the ones for which you can prove termination, you've got it. But, but this tells us some termination proofs are very large. Right. Yep. That's exactly what it is. Some termination proofs are very large. But yeah, you can, um, and it, it's true, you can do that, but you're not going to get the Herbron girdle computable functions, right? Nobody's going to get those. You have a, and uh, you, you could argue that you have just as good a chance of uh, getting close in any language, but in, uh, yeah, OK, but you're going to pay the cost when you prove termination. OK, so let's look at the core uh, logical types. What are they? So if you're writing down from a logician's point of view, you would say, well, I have and, or, not, uh, using false, um, implies, for all, and exists, right? You, you need all those guys. But you can boil this down to saying, well, if I use the for all quantifier, that's going to also pick up implication, right? And if I use the existential, I'm going to get and. So you really need just these two guys and or. That's going to give you, and, and you'll need some way of expressing not, and we have the void type or faults there. So those are the standard logical types. And you've, I'm assuming we all know these cold now, right? You've seen this during the, yep. Yeah. Uh, could you explain why exists corresponds to and? Oh, the exists here? Yeah, so let's look at um, what an existential is here. Let's say I write uh, there exists uh, an element in the domain D such that <coughs> P of X holds the realizer for that is a pair, right, where you're going to get D and then you're going to get a proof here of P of uh, that proposition. So the elements there are uh, ordered pairs and that's what you need to realize an AND where you wouldn't have dependency. This is a, a dependent product, if you like, a dependent Cartesian product and the uh, AND is an independent Cartesian product. Right? So for A and B, if I, if I write down A and B, that turns into the product type, A cross B. The realizers are uh, pairs, the realizer for A and the realizer for B. Are we all, are we all good with this? Right? I mean, that, okay. So that's, those are the core logical types. And I think, you know, we... Uh, we know a lot about them. So that's, they've been studied for a long time. And I'm going to tell you the history. The propositions as types idea is centered on, on this. And I'll talk in a few minutes about the history of it. But I, I think I should explain a couple of uh, proof rules here just so you can see the, on the board the style that Mark has been illustrating, this top-down uh, style. So let's just pick something we want to prove, uh, and I'll state the, the way the rules look. So we have a sequent calculus with hypotheses here. So this could be just a, a list of, of your hypotheses. And suppose you want to prove uh, A and B. We just did that example there. Um, the way we do it in this top-down thing is we say, OK, I'm going to give the rule by what rule to prove or the tactic name, and then we're going to generate sub-goals. OK, so the, our rule here for this is pair, in a, in a sense. 
So we write the thing like that, because we know we're going to go after a pair. And this generates the sub-goals to prove uh, A and B. And when you do that, let's suppose you finish the proof here. You got by something A there, and you got by something B by doing a sub-proof here. You got a lot of, did a lot of work. We then think of just substituting um, those, the realizers for the sub-goals into this pair construct and that gives us the realizer for the AND, right? So that, uh, we like this top-down style. It's uh, an LCF style, but this was, um, and the R in Perl, so new Perl is version new of the PRL system, and the R in there stands for refinement logic. So it's program refinement logic, and Joe Bates, uh, was very keen on this idea from Nicholas Vert that we prove by refinement. He was an AI guy. And uh, Tim Teitelbaum at the time was doing the synthesizer generator, which supported this thing uh, wonderfully. So all of our rules are read that way. And again, every time we submit a paper to the logicians, they have a fit. They say, why do you guys do things upside down? Your proof should all be hypotheses first and go some goals. Well, we just say, could you learn to live with that? And if we've got a good enough result, they, they will. But sometimes they just get so mad. You, you know, it's like at all of us, at computer science, they say, you computer scientists do things your own way. You know, why can't you follow our style? We say, well, you can't implement it as well. This is what, what you're doing. You're taking a, a goal and you're trying to prove it. So the, AI people love it. So when we talk to the AI guys, they say, wow, finally, the logicians are thinking the way we do. So uh, let, let's see how, how we do um, 